The foreign ministers of the G7 countries are meeting in Japan and is expected taking a strong pro-Israel position. What is this humanitarian pause that is the subject of discussions? A new report indicates that globally health systems are doing better when it comes to recording cases of tuberculosis. But the challenge remains steep. What is the way ahead? And the US has suspended talks on some aspects of digital trade in the Indo-Pacific trade framework and has actually reversed its position. What is this about turn about? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. As Israel's horrendous assault on Gaza continues, the foreign ministers of the G7 countries are meeting in Japan. However, hoping for any sense of balance or perspective for them would definitely be a mistake as most of these countries seem to be firmly backing Israel and the United States. This is clear from their votes in the UN as well as talks about what is called a humanitarian pause. Now, this humanitarian pause is not a ceasefire and is in fact a very cynical postscript to the word humanitarian. We are with us, Abdul Fumur. Abdul, thanks for joining us. The G7 as a bloc is definitely the most suspect in this context, you know, comprising countries which have taken some of the worst stances, I think one can very easily say when it comes to the Israeli war on Gaza, on the genocidal war. But what has this foreign minister's meeting sort of come up with? What are the conclusions that, or what are the suggestions they're coming up with? Well, they have uh, taken a similar stance as they have taken uh, before the meeting. Of course, this is similar. Nothing new has come out except for the fact that in, uh, they have stated in the written format that uh, the need of a humanitarian pause. This humanitarian pause has been uh, kind of uh, uttered many times before in the United Nations Security Council meetings by the same set of countries. And so therefore it is nothing new. They have reiterated the similar instances of them believing in the Israeli right to self-defense, them believing that Hamas was responsible for what happened on October 7, and them believing that uh, whatever Israel has been doing since last one month is all justified. So uh, it seems that apart from the fact that they have been a little critical to the uh, settler violence in the occupied uh, West Bank and in East Jerusalem, which has resulted in uh, many fatalities there, uh, Palestinian fatalities there, which is nothing new, which is going on for as long as the occupation has been uh, has been there so overall this is what has happened uh, if you just want uh, if you just want to see the zest of what was uh, uh, what is the result of the g7 uh, meeting so they have called for humanitarian pause and whether that they will they are serious about it uh, will be known in few hours from now if israel agrees to it right abdul i think we need to sort of also go into this question of what this humanitarian pause or this humanitarian truce is and it's actually I guess a bit of uh, you know very cynical wordplay because the rest of the world see there are people governments across the global south people in the global north they're all calling for a ceasefire but you see these countries sort of talking about what is called a human governments talking about what is called a humanitarian pause and I think this is also even the rhetoric that Israel Netanyahu also seems to be using at certain points of time so what ex what is the difference between this humanitarian pause and a ceasefire well, uh, the ceasefire would have meant that there is a longer, much more sustainable uh, uh, kind of uh, seizing uh, of uh, the Israeli air bombings on Gaza or the ground offensive. It's kind of a complete halt of all that. Uh, uh, the period one can debate on, but uh, it will be a more sustainable and longer uh, pause in the, all those atrocities so that there would be a, a kind of uh, stop taking of what has uh, what is the overall condition humanitarian condition on the ground and kind of uh, attempts to kind of address the the issues which Palestinians are facing because there is no drinking water there is no, no electricity there is not enough medicine no no food for the majority of Palestinian people in Gaza for a very long time so all these needs to be addressed apart from the fact that uh, the people who, more than twenty seven thousand of Palestinians who are injured in the bombings uh, need to be uh, uh, taken care of. So all these uh, things need to be arranged and that needs a longer, uh, much more meaningful uh, stop uh, in Israeli uh, attack uh, on Gaza. 
which could also lead to a kind of uh, some kind of sustained peace uh, at a uh, cessation of hostilities pause means that there will be a breathing space for say few hours israel will stop bombing the regions and then whatever you could do in those few hours you do move out and the israel will start uh, bombing again it it in other words it is it will also adv- it will be advantageous to uh, uh, israel because israel has not committed uh, to not attacking any civilian uh, uh, infrastructure or any aid uh, which is supplied during the meanwhile uh, uh, during the time of the period so it is basically an attempt to kind of also give israeli forces some kind of breathing space so that they can renew their attack over palestinians so uh, it is beneficial for uh, uh, israel in some ways and uh, it is uh, and it, uh, it does not serve any purpose when it comes to the palestinians uh, addressing the Palest- humanitarian issue in uh, in palestinian territories and abdul uh, a very important point that you make also the fact that like you said israel is you know making outrageous claims about hospitals being hamas centers it has targeted i think a red cross convoy was also recently targeted uh, health relief workers health workers all of them dying as well so the idea of this truce seems uh, quite uh, you know absurd and it's uh, significant that the seven most powerful countries in the world are very much on board with that idea as well and also i think blinken making some comments about how neither hamas nor israel should be allowed to control gaza uh, at this point uh, you know after all this happens as well yeah so yeah, of course the, if you see uh, red cross uh, international red cross has faced attacks the hospitals have faced attacks uh, and and is rightly pointed out israel has been claiming that these attacks are not uh, uh, by mistake they have deliberately uh, uh, done that because these things these facilities these uh, um, uh, institutions infrastructure has been have been used by hamas so uh, in a way if there is a pause uh, of course they will they will have a could, could more opportunity to kind of figure out where all they can attack once the pause ends and that's a tactical uh, stand they have by the way they have given a condition that ceasefire or uh, even this pause by the way will only come if uh, uh, hamas and other palestinian resistance release all the hostages they, ha- they took during uh, o- october 7 operation al aqsa flood and until that is that happens there will be no pause so in, in a way it is if hamas and other palestinian resistance forces release all the hostages they will be in no condition to Uh, kind of have any bargaining uh, power vis-a-vis israel and that will lead to uh, further uh, deterioration of the situation on the ground the uh, and that's exactly what is the purpose of this kind of talk of humanitarian pause it has no real intention of serving the humanitarian uh, interest thank you so much abdul for the analysis the world health organization has released a 2023 global tuberculosis report which is both good news and bad news now the good news is that there is some reversal of the impact on covid-19 on tb treatment tb patients are among the worst affected due to disruptions to health systems and tracking mechanisms caused by covid-19 the latest report says that the number of patients diagnosed in 2022 was 7.5 million the bad news however is that so much remains to be done to give these patients access to good medication at economical rates not to mention other issues such as drug resistant tb we have with us anna rachara the health people health movement for more Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Now, this report is widely looked forward to by activists across the health sector because it provides very crucial indicators on how the world is uh, doing regarding combating a very important uh, disease at this point. And we do know that over the past few years, there has been a huge amount of concern because of the impact COVID nineteen had on the treatment of tuberculosis itself. So, maybe could you first maybe give us some of the salient points uh, regarding what the data? What does it show at this point? Sure. So uh, the initial point would be that there seems to be uh, an uptake in the in the global recovery when it comes to uh, TB diagnosis and treatment, uh, especially when we talk about the impact that COVID nineteen has had, as you as you mentioned already. Uh, so uh, for the last couple of years, we've seen a drop in reported cases uh, in some of the countries which we know that are uh, specifically impacted by the, the by the TB burden. Uh, including the Philippines and Indonesia and India, of course, uh, and so this report seems to point that uh, things are getting better in that way. 
So uh, it also shows that there are still millions of people being diagnosed with TB every year, uh, which is a very worrying fact, uh, given the given the fact that uh, you know uh, we've been living with TB for so uh, for so long. Uh, the report point, points out that uh, there's about 7.5 million people who were diagnosed with TB uh, in 2022, uh, and this is uh, this is essentially. Uh, it's actually quite an important point because it's the highest figure that the WHO uh, has uh, has published since uh, they began monitoring this uh, in uh, 1000 uh, so in 1995 uh, so um, what the report says is that this increase in the number reported um, points to the fact that there is improved access uh, and there is an improved provision of health services um, in countries, including in India, in Indonesia, and in the Philippines, as I said. So uh, these three countries together uh, were uh, responsible for about 60% uh, of the global reduction of TB cases uh, in the in the first COVID-19 years. Uh, and Essentially, what happened last year in 2022 was that they uh, they surpassed the numbers that they were reporting. Uh, they were reporting in 2019. Um, what needs to be said, however, is that you know uh, while this the, the report shows or indicates that um, things might be picking up after the pandemic, uh, there is still a significant gap when it comes to funding. Uh, so, uh, you know, whichever indicator essentially we pick from the global targets set at the international level, uh, when it comes to TB, we're, the, the world is majorly falling behind. So there is um, there is especially uh, an especially big problem when it comes to uh, development and research of new uh, TB, TB medical products, including vaccines, including drugs. Uh, and this is, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think I need to uh, to stress how important of a problem this is, uh, because we know that there are million, millions of people who still don't have access uh, to life-saving drugs uh, and are therefore uh, forced to undertake treatment, uh, which is very difficult, which can have serious side effects. Uh, and uh, which essentially mar uh, marks their lives uh, in in uh, in the years following that. And just to sort of clarify, the report says that uh, it seems a bit paradoxical, maybe, but it says that the increase in the number of cases, uh, reported cases, is a positive because it basically means that uh, the health systems are back to sort of working and they're recording these cases, which means that treatment is taking place, right? In, in cases like this, if we, uh, you, you, you know, if um, if we have had a period when reporting was low uh, because of the COVID COVID nineteen pandemic, so the bad is, you know, the COVID nineteen pandemic was so much of a stress on health systems that people were not able to access the services, they were not be, uh, they were not able to get diagnosis. Uh, but also, you know, uh, it, it has to be said, an increase in number, uh, it shows the increased capacity of the health system to actually see that there's a problem. Uh, but it's still not, uh, you know, it's not a sign that we're, uh, we're making actual progress because right. making actual progress would mean that more people can access the treatments and that they're actually benefiting from those treatments. And as I said, the... The situation with the research and development uh, point uh, shows that it's essentially that's essentially not happening. So you know we still know that about um, two in five of uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis are not getting treatment, and that's you know that has even more implications because dr drug-resistant uh, tuberculosis acts in different ways than maybe the let's call it um, traditional tuberculosis would act. Right. So, and as far as activists are concerned, I think what are the key points that, you know, uh, more pressure needs to be applied on, there needs to be more action as far as uh, governmental bodies, as far as health systems are concerned? Well, uh, those points have been pointed out for, uh, well, um, unfortunately for years now, uh, they haven't changed much. So, you know, uh, for example, if we look at late, late last year already, there was a report by some uh, activist group, uh, including the tre tre treatment action group, uh, and the stop, uh, uh, yeah. So 
essentially the treatment action group, um, who said that there were important milestones being reached when it comes to, uh, to how the world uh, approaches tuberculosis. And so they said that uh, then there was um, a 1 billion US dollars mark was hit when it comes to, uh, when it comes to investment into, uh, into TB. Uh, but what they said then, uh, so almost a year ago, was that uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and because of the lag that was accumulated throughout this time, uh, that was not a realistic expectation anymore. So it's not not even more $1 billion or $2 billion yearly that should be invested in TB research and diagnosis and uh, research and development, sorry, um, but it should be a, around five. So, you know, uh, and when we look at those numbers, there's, again, uh, no doubt that uh, not enough progress is being made and that essentially it's not tb is not getting the same attention that uh, that uh, other diseases are getting so you know if we compare it to the investments uh, that for example covid-19 medical products have had it's nowhere near there there uh, and it's been a, pro a problem for much much longer and not to mention the fact that i think the bulk of the load is like you said in countries of the global south which really need far more attention as well, both from their governments, but also, I think, in terms of international support as well. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, Anna, for speaking to us, for giving us an evaluation. And uh, We've been tracking this issue on the show for a long time now and we'll continue to do so. Thank you so much. And finally, the U.S. has suspended talks on certain digital trade aspects when it comes to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Initiative. The U.S. has also reversed its position and is no longer pushing for rules that enable cross-border flow of data and prevent data localization. Now, this reversal by the U.S. is based on domestic pressures that seek to regulate, regulate big tech. And to understand this further, we have with us Anish. Anish, we are in the complex realm of international trade negotiations, not the easiest to talk about. But let's quickly uh, go through the topics. So, what are these negotiations that the U.S. has you know, taken this position on? What are the reasons? Well, currently, uh, the kind of negotiations that we're talking about is basically for uh, digital trade rules, and that would have impacted, uh, you know, even policies, national policies, or sovereign policies on uh, how, uh, you know, digital trade needs to be conducted, and also how flow of data, and this includes data localization, uh, matters of data sovereignty, uh, affect uh, being affected as part of this trade, these trade negotiations. The fact that the U.S. has withdrawn is primarily a reflection of, uh, you know, it considering a, a different tack, uh, track on how to uh, deal with these matters. Now, very recently, uh, we did see uh, the U.S. withdrawing from uh, the WTO uh, initiative where of about 90 countries to push for a sort of um, a deal that would have uh, that would have allowed for what it calls free flow of data, uh, but that would mean that it would uh, prevent other countries from Im uh, implementing policies uh, that uh, you know hamper or you know uh, that uh, regulate competition or regulate monopolies and obviously uh, impose data localization uh, for their uh, people uh, because obviously the uh, the whole thing with as you said like trade negotiations are uh, obviously complex but uh, uh, you know digital trade or you know data uh, trade of data or you know flow of data is even more complex because it doesn't really uh, you know come within you know uh, geographic boundaries it's quite uh, far more different than that and so uh, if countries do not have the uh, the liberty to actually put in place anti-monopolistic practices or policies, uh, you know, to foster a fair competition and for uh, most of all, uh, to impose a certain kind of rules that will make sure that data sovereignty is protected, that their the privacy of their people are protected. It is something that, uh, you know, uh, that would impact a lot of, you know, even sovereign decisions on uh, significantly other matters as well. And so the fact that U.S. has withdrawn from it is far more significant because obviously U.S. was one of the biggest advocates for such kind of uh, rules, international binding international rules, regulations that would have 
you know, prevented other countries from having their own independent policies on tra uh, digital trade. And uh, withdrawing that also has its own complex kind of context, uh, both domestic and obviously other international pressures. But it's definitely a sort of victory of, uh, you know, uh, progressive movements uh, that the U.S. government for the first time is actually overlooking a certain, a very key demand that has been raised by big tech or, you know, major tech monopolies within the U.S. itself. Right, Anish, as far as I understand, there are two or three angles to it. One key aspect is that obviously this is not driven by any kind of sensitivity to the data flow or questions of sovereignty of countries, but the U.S. own desire, you know, U.S. own domestic pools where there is clearly a very strong push to sort of regulate big tech within the U.S. itself. We have seen uh, the FTC in the United States, for instance, take action. We have seen Google, for instance, falling, uh, Google and Amazon both both falling under the lens. And I think there's a section of the uh, Democratic Party, especially, which is trying to sort of rein in big tech in the U.S. And that is why they've withdrawn. But also uh, important to, I guess, note that this is happening in the context of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, discussions where the U.S. was trying to create its own alternative to uh, relations between countries in the Pacific region and China itself. Yes, uh, so it's quite interesting, actually. Uh, we can begin with the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework. Uh, in that, uh, obviously, one of the biggest uh, uh, partners that it is trying to pull in, that the U.S. is trying to pull in, uh, in a sort of competitive uh, set of trade uh, relations in the region, uh, is India. And India has a very stated uh, uh, policy of, uh, you know, data localization, protecting, uh, you know, data uh, sovereignty and also uh, preventing any kind of uh, digital monopolies to take hold within their own country. And it has definitely uh, opposed in the WTO uh, the same kind of uh, regulations that would have prevented all of these facts. Uh, and that uh, that some uh, that a country like India uh, cannot be uh, out of its purview if it wants to expand its influence or uh presence uh, or at least trade or economic presence in the region and uh, so that is one major aspect and these considerations were part of uh just one part of the aspect but the other as you pointed out has there is significant domestic pressures and it is not just like the progressive groups and also certain political leadership within the us but also uh, a significant number of progressive movements within the U.S. who have pressured the government to take action against digital monopolies, uh, who pretty much work as sovereign, sovereigns of themselves. We have seen that when it comes to dealing with a, a significant number of social media giants who have taken, uh, you know, a very problematic position when it comes to uh, privacy, when it comes to uh, the use of AI, when it comes to uh, even how data is being used or commercialized and that is definitely part of it us is definitely far behind when it comes to its other western counterparts when it comes to protecting people's uh, privacy their uh, you know digital footprint and so on uh, but it's definitely uh, being uh, brought up to speed in in the sense that there is significant uh, pressures within the country from the, from many people to actually uh, you know rein in these monopolies who uh, you know, pretty much work outside of government regulations in many ways, and they do not want any kind of new regulations. And the, this is quite significant. As I said, it's quite significant that uh, a U.S. government is actually taking uh, a position that is, uh, you know, very clearly opposed to uh, big tech uh, monopolies. And that clearly shows the kind of impact that uh, popular movement, progressive groups, and in fact, also, uh, you know, even uh, people, sections within the leadership uh, and within the establishment have taken uh, when it comes to uh, these monopolies. And it clearly speaks of how uh, it is and like it, it actually shows how it is important, absolutely important to reign in these corporations as well. When you see that, uh, you know, a Biden administration, uh, you know, somebody like Biden, who is a very establishment pro establishment pro corporate kind of guy, uh, you know, taking a stated position of this sort. And that uh, is something that can have its own kind of repercussions across the world as well, including the WTO, where uh, these negotiations are set to happen uh, in next year, uh, where any kind of binding uh, regulations or rules would be put in place. And uh, this position is definitely going to impact that.
Right, Anish, thank you so much for that. Uh, also, very complex topic and very interesting discussions as well. So, we'll come back to it at some point. That's all we have in this episode of the Daily Debrief. Do tune in tomorrow for another episode. Also, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Thank you.